Next up, we're going to have Dr. Mike Crimmins. He's on the faculty uh, of the Department of Soil, Water, and Environmental Science at the University of Arizona and is a Climate Science, Science Extension Specialist for Arizona <coughs> Cooperative Extension. In this position, he provides climate science support to re resource manager managers across Arizona by assessing information needs, synth synthesizing and transferring relevant research re results, and conducting applied research projects. His extension and research work supports resource management across multiple sectors, including rangelands, forests and wildfire, and water resources, as well as informing policy and decision makers. This work aims to support managers by increasing climate science literacy, as well as developing strategies to adapt to a changing climate. He also serves as a drought monitoring expert on the Arizona Governor's Drought Task Force, and has worked with countries across Arizona to implement drought preparedness and impact monitoring. Good morning. I think I'm, I'm in front of lunch, right? Yeah. Don't worry about it. Oh yeah, right. Famous <laughs> <laughs> last word, right? Um, so I'm the climatologist to try to uh, provide some context. That's my job is to try, try to provide context to. Um, any climate data, any variability we've been seeing in the historical record, and then I'll, I'll try to look forward a little bit. And I think you'll be amused with this question here as though I have the answer to either of them and that I actually know uh, where we are, where we're headed. I'll start off with the drop monitor map from last week. Has everybody seen this? Everybody pay attention to this? Is it right? It's usually a shrug, right? I usually get a shrug, right? And that's my attitude as well. I'm part of um, the Arizona committee that helps draw the lines on this map here in Arizona, and we've, it's been dry, we've been expanding it, but I don't know if we've nailed it. And again, I think that the drought monitor um, as a product is a kind of a one size fits all. Maybe it doesn't fit anybody in particular because it's trying to be kind of everything to everybody at the same time. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, what I want to try to do with this presentation is walk back through some of the recent conditions the historical stuff has been really covered quite nicely by the other presenters today. I'll just I'll touch that again. And then talk about a little bit of work that I'm actually trying to do to really dive in and draw out the nuance of Arizona climate variability with respect to land management and, and rangeland management in particular. So we'll go here. We'll walk back all the way through um, about a year ago. This is what we were looking at last uh, January 3rd. And you can see that there was drought in Arizona, California was in the grips of epic drought, and lo and behold, that, that reversed quite quickly in dramatic fashion as we go from January 3rd to April 4th here. And even in parts of northern Arizona, enough snow came in December and January that erased some of the drought conditions there. We continue to bump along the bottom as we have been for the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, by July, with spring getting epically warm and epically dry again, we start to bring the drought conditions back into southern Arizona. And then by last fall, we have this sort of creeping crud of drought coming back across the state because of a really unusual summer that I think we can all agree was weird. It was weird. And the climate data, if you don't look at it quite right, can tell you a story that's not quite the right thing, depending on what you're trying to manage for. So one thing I'm going to do, and I do this with all my talks, is I really like this tool. And I encourage you to check this tool out and play with this tool. This is the West Wide Drought Tracker, which allows you to take gridded precipitation data that is uh, created on a monthly basis and it, it updates itself right at the turn of the, the next month. It goes all the way back to 1895 for the whole continental US and the, some of the data that Mitch was showing earlier is the same data set, just a different interface. It allows you to do some, some really cool things here about um, sort of opening these drawers up and having information. And it can be really overwhelming, quite honestly. And in the climate profession, our job is to make new tools and lots of them and continue to throw them out at you, right? And so we now are at the point where we have so much information, it's hard to reel it back and say, what's the right information I should look at, depending on what I'm trying to manage for, or where I'm at, and, and what's some of the background climate variability. So we're gonna dig into this a little bit. We're gonna take some of this data, and you can do maps, and you can do time series. Um, this is Palmer Drought Severity Index, and then a time series here, and we're gonna look at some of these particular uh, maps here. So. Going back, just looking at last year, ending with last month through December of 2017, this was the precip in rank percentile, and so the yellow is below normal, and the bottom 33%, and then this is the bottom 10% here. So 
If we go back to the calendar year, and again, I'm very guilty of this too, of showing you the calendar year as the sort of characterization of climate variability over time. It's a good first step, but we know here in Arizona it's all about nuance, it's all about that context, and it's about timing, and it's about seasonality. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit more. But if we just take 2017, and we look at the precip, it's a bit of a shrug. It's on the dry side. Temps, though, in the 117-year, no, it's longer than that, 117-year record, um, record warmest. So we've got this sort of collision of kind of dry, very warm. And Mitch was, was talking about that earlier. We're going to try to draw that out. How do we put these two things together? If we look just back at the last wet season, how did the last wet season look? This is a precip map, a graded precip across Arizona for the proper monsoon season by the Weather Service, which is June 15th through the end of September. So you're getting the precip along the Mogollon Rim and then filling in through southern Arizona. It's percent of average. If it's white, it's near the long-term average. So we have some pockets of wet, a lot of sort of near white, and then the sort of lean towards dry. Kind of typical monsoon season, if you sum it up by the three-month or this 108-day period. But if we look at just Tucson Airport, we got all of the precip in about three weeks, right? So the seasonal total didn't really tell us that. We ended up near average, or actually above average, the seasonal total, but the timing of the precip here, as far as its normal spread here, about hitting half the annual total right about August 1st, we had half of the annual total, or half of the seasonal total, by the uh, about the second week of July, and then we were done, right? So then thinking about this from, so again, I tell this story to myself because climatologists, this is all we do. We just look at precip totals and precip data. To go to drought, droughts on the landscape, Drought's contextual, drought is if it's meeting your needs as far as having water coming in. So we're trying to sort of unravel this a little bit more. So this then suggests that even with above average monsoon precip, this is not the best way to get your seasonal total precip. All right, so we have that in our back pocket. Okay, so then let's go back and look at seasonality. I think seasonality is just such an underrated thing um, in thinking about climate in the Southwest and it's largely missed when we talk about drought monitoring at a national scale. When the drought monitor authors, who are rotating chairs, none of them are in the southwest. The closest is in, is in Reno every couple of weeks. Um, that drought monitor author, Asheville, Lincoln, Washington, DC, really struggles with this idea of you getting the right precip at the right time. So if we look at the last couple of years, this is a cookie cutout of Pima County, so that same prism graded data, countywide average, or county, countywide total for precip. The blue areas here are the historic variability. It's a little hard to see here, but this is the extreme above the 95th percentile of total precip that would have happened in this month. You can see the blue repeats itself, because that's the background expectation, the climatology. The red line is what has actually happened over the last three years. So there's July, really stands out as being near record wet, record wet for um, the Tucson Airport proper. This is August, and then this is September. So really hitting the guardrails between record wet, record dry. Here's our fall at the very bottom. Then if we roll it back to last spring, um, near record dry, um, an above average, above median precipitation, kind of oddly timed, not too oddly timed, but right in the middle of the winter here. Last summer, not too bad. We go back here, some really oddly timed events here. This was, this was the El Nino that was supposed to sort of sock us in with wet um, wall to wall for two seasons, and it didn't. It bounced around with slightly above median, below average, and below average, and then we had a, we had a weird um, above average I guess it's wet May, which is it raining at all here <laughs> in the southwest. So the climate uh, metrics get a little confused by that. So then looking at it this way, are we getting repeat seasons of wet conditions? Well, the summer's not too bad above here. I don't know if we can count this as a wet <coughs> summer because we ended up having record wet and then near record dry at the other, the other, hand, the other side of it. And the winters, eh, it's a shrug too. So it's kind of a mess. Right? It's just kind of a mess as we go backwards in time here. Okay, so this graph then is Pima County drilled out going back to 1900. Same prism data. It should be very similar to the graph um, that Mitch showed and uh, similar to the ones that Mark even showed earlier with some of the earlier data to the, the late 1800s here. 
So it shows, I went off to dwell on this here, but just some of the, some of the big years here, um, the pluvials or the wet periods in the early 1900s, 50s drought, the 80s pluvial, the wet period here in 1983, near wettest year on record, these would probably be interesting to compare based on gauge density and how we're actually capturing that signal. And then you can see here 2017, um, you know, this was, in my mind, this was wetter because our bar is so low in the last 20 years. I almost thought, hey, this drought's turning around in the last couple of years. And then that 2017 reminded me, no, we're not out of this. We're actually now back down in some um, rare territory. And speaking of rare territory, one of the metrics that I use and quite a few of us use, I know Mitch and I have been working on a project where we're using this, is something called the Standardized Precipitation Index. So this is um, simply taking precip data at different windows. This is just annual totals. And then comparing it to its historic distribution. And then converting it to standard deviation units. I know it's a lot of stats to throw to you right before lunch. But what it does is it, in this particular 12 month, ending December, which would be the year, these blue bars sticking up are very rare, and the red bars sticking down here past uh, negative two are very rare. And as you get towards the middle here, this is, this is average right here. So these standard de deviation units give you an understanding of how often you'd expect to see an event of this magnitude in the period of record, okay? So you see the very deep drought, as you'd expect to see, only occurring a couple of times uh, within 100 years. And so when we look at the, the last 18 years, 15 of the last 18 have been below this zero line, which would be average. And then a handful of them are actually below negative one. And then this was 2009, which was a dry winter, but an epically dry summer, which is of major consequence from a range management standpoint, um, pushing that negative two um, characterization here. Okay, so again, as Mitch showed earlier, temps are going up, it's getting warmer, and it's very consistently getting warmer. Um, even when you cookie cut it out to Pima County, and we look at here, 2017 was the, that is not the second year, it's the second warmest year on record. You could probably do that rank order and find out that that should be number one. <laughs> Apologize for that little typo there, <coughs> last time I updated it. Um, 2017 is indeed the warmest year on record. And then if we cram these two things together, there's another drought index called the Standardized Precipitation Minus Evapotranspiration Index. Okay, so think about that. Precip's coming in, evapotranspiration's going out. So it's trying to do this water balance um, accounting to give us an indication of drought intensity with temperature and precipitation together. So as temps go up, you see droughts, cooler droughts, aren't quite as intense as warmer droughts. Okay, so we have this just precip, this precip and temperature. Okay, this is a heavy club. I'm not sure if it's the exact characterization. We know temperature is important, we know temperature is part of water balances, but that's really what I want to get to know is, is this the worst case scenario? Is it somewhere in between here and here? Or is it even worse than this? And it probably depends on and we know it depends on it depends on the soils, and it depends on the plants. If we're thinking about vegetation management and its ability to deal with these kinds of stressors, and on the climate side, it's going to depend on the timing and the intensity of the precipitation, right? So we, as climatologists, use these pretty coarse tools to try to keep track of it. But I think we got to drill another level deeper to try to understand these things a bit more. So, so this is what it would look like when you take just precip. This is the 12-month SPI the record temperatures, and then this is SPI. So this is one characterization of drought for last year. It's not great by any means. And then you add temperature on top of it, it's much worse. So this is interesting to me. Which of these is right? And I guess it probably depends. It depends on where you are and what you're trying to get at. And it's possible that it's worse than this as well. And you can see there we have pretty wide um, error bounds around this. Okay, so. One thing I've got, and I want to just give you a, a quick look at some of the research that I've got going on right now that we're trying to drill into this a little bit more. So to me, it's about soil moisture, right? So as a climatologist, we stay out of the soil, right? I don't want to mess. It's too complicated, right? And so I'm dipping a toe in this. And so it's going to look very clunky to um, ecologists and, and 
soil scientists, but we're trying it. And I've, I've, I've got some, some friends to sort of support me who are soil physicists and pedologists and, and those kinds of things. So we know soil moisture is really important. We don't do soil moisture monitoring, right? We try. There are some data sets out there, the scan sites um, from NRCS. Um, they're very few and far between, and the one, the one at Walnut Gulch is a great resource, and all the soil moisture monitoring at Walnut Gulch is a great resource, but in operational drop monitoring, it's not across the landscape. There are a couple more. There's one in Elgin now, Climate Reference Network Station. There's one at the Desert Museum, Climate Reference Network Station, but they're few and far between, and their records are very short. So when you want to try to use soil moisture and you want to understand, is that unusual or not? A short record doesn't give you a lot to go on. So what we've tried to do is actually take a soil moisture model and create a climate record out of it by modeling our way out of this. And you're already going to go, oh, you're going to shudder. And I know I shudder too when I think about doing this, but I think it's useful. And I wanted to show you some of, this, some of these results. So if we have a soil moisture record as a comparative metric, we can compare SPI and SPEI, standardized precipitation index, only precip, standardized precipitation minus evapotranspiration, precip and temp combined, and then the soil moisture metric. So what we've done is we've used the soil moisture model. <clears throat> we estimate um, evaporation and transpiration as outputs and um, inputs as total uh, daily precipitation. So it's daily modeling going back to 1950. We're using the airport data. We've got a couple other stations, including uh, Winslow, El Paso, no, is that right? Yeah. Winslow, El Paso, and uh, Albuquerque. I'm just going to show you some Tucson data today. Um, and it's, again, very simple, 500 centimeter loam. No, no, no profile, no horizons, any of that kind of stuff. And uh, simple vegetation doesn't change. So again, it's a baby step towards having better accounting of precip that is, I believe, more sophisticated. It's not, I believe. It is more sophisticated than SPI or SPEI, probably closer to what's actually happening on the ground. OK, so you can do things like this. Force it with our seasonality, which I think is really important. Wet season, dry season, wet season, background temperature strong evapotranspiration in this season. And then this is what it looks like in the profile. So this is 100 centimeters. It's good. It gets wet in the winter, sort of. Soil dries out, and then it gets wet again, and then it kind of um, diddles around in the fall uh, season out back into the winter. <coughs> and then you get these really cool plots daily, which is, this is 50 centimeters here. You can see there's wetting fronts that happen with these events that go through time. So we do this daily accounting soil moisture and then I coarsify it and turn it back into a monthly soil moisture index for comparison back to SPI. And I'll do it at 10 centimeters, 30, and 50. And you can see at 10 centimeters, there's a lot of variability from month to month. As you go deeper in the soil, you get longer lags, which is what those drought indices are trying to do anyways. Are they getting it right? So the reason I want to do this is I want to go back to this site and I want to know, do I need to look at all of these to get a sense of drought when we're talking about land management? Or are there a couple that I could consult? When we correlate our indices, SPI and SPEI, against our soil moisture, what this says is that with a correlation of about 0.8 for SPI, and just slightly lower for SPEI, the two-month SPI, as you go along, it's kind of obvious, at 10 centimeters, goes up and down with SPI and SPEI and soil moisture covariate. And that's not bad. 0.8. Um, it's not bad, it's not perfect, but it's suggesting that these precip and temperature and precip only uh, metrics get about that when we compare it against more sophisticated soil moisture modeling. If we go deeper at 30 centimeters, you can see it drops off. SPI is greater than SPI, just slightly. It's probably not distinguishably different. So this is interesting to me, and I'm not sure why this is happening, but the addition of temperature at short time scales doesn't improve the soil moisture monitoring. Okay? And so this is something I feel like we've got to figure out, right? is at short time scales, I think the timing and intensity of precip to generating soil moisture is more important than the background temperature. As you get to longer time scales, 6 to 12 months to 2 years, background temperature becomes more important, and you're depleting those soil moisture resources. But if you're periodically drying the soil out anymore, it doesn't matter, right? You, can, you can't make a dry soil any drier if it's warmer out. It's just hit zero, right? So that, to me, is some nuance that comes out of this, this stuff. So this is, um, these are, I'm sorry, this green is terrible, but this is um, the soil moisture modeling going back to 2000 to 2015. 
and then the two drought indices. You can see they track each other pretty well. And this is the difference of the soil moisture um, <coughs> modeling from each index. And so you can see that the residual here, it, it's not bad sometimes, but it's pretty big at other times. And then sometimes it just, they just totally diverge. And this is interesting to me. And this is when you get situations where there's oddly time precip or probably rightly time precip when we think about soil moisture. These two went completely um, out to lunch here with uh, SPI and SPI underestimating drought when the drought was actually worse than our drought monitoring was suggesting. And here is the plot of precip in the background here. These are the drought indices sort of bumping along. And you can see here that, and this is in 2006. Anybody remember 2005, 2006? Terrible, terrible drought here. Pro and by some accounts, worse than 2002, 2003 from the timing of the precip standpoint. And this winter, unfortunately, is a pretty close analog to 2005, 2003. This is a little bit of precip occurring, and I'll show you this. At this time, the drought indices go, hooray! And then soil moisture modeling says, forget it. That was useless. This is what that precip looked like. The monthly drought indices got excited about some March precip, and they shouldn't have. Okay, so that's, that's where this is interesting to me. I'm not sure how to draw these out or how to detect these when we're using our traditional uh, drought monitoring metrics. Okay, so if we use that information just right now, two month SPI, this would be November and December for 10 centimeter soil moisture proxy with some large air bars around it. This is what the shallow soil moisture um, pr perspective is right now, except for discounting the precip that's occurred in the last couple of weeks. And then deeper with even bigger error bounds would be the last six months gives you something on this order, a map like this. So this is where we're going. We're not done, we're pushing in this area, and I hopefully have more to report as we go forward. Okay, even more amusing, I'll try to tell you what I think is gonna happen for the rest of the spring. Okay, yeah, uh-oh, yeah, this is, this is famous last words. And you know when I say this stuff out loud, typically the opposite happens. So this could be good for all of us, <laughs> um, seeing how this plays out. Uh, what we're in right now is we're locked in to a very strong, and not strong, but a moderate but persistent La Nina that's giving us a very predictable, very um, uh, typical pattern. And I didn't think it was going to deliver on as being as typical as it is, but it certainly is um, showing up. And you can see the colder air here looks like the east, the dry across the southern region. Um, Texas and Florida have been wetter. They've gotten more snow than much of the rest of the country, which is unusual. Um, it has been wetter in the Pacific Northwest, and we are certainly shaking out as dry. And you can see here when you look at seasonal average uh, El Nino versus La Nina events, blue or La Nina, red or El Nino, um, that we tend to have seasonal totals that are for December, January, February that are below average when we get into the blue. So we're just, we're falling in line with that. And this is the current strength here. So based on the past as a guide to the future, which doesn't always uh, happen, here's my failed, not mine, but everybody's failed uh, El Nino right here. The, the, Godzilla El Nino ended up being more like a Godzilla, Godzilla El Ni La Nina lookalike with 2016 totals. But here I'd expect to see the seasonal total below average. And that's exactly what the official forecast looked like. Um, below average for Jan February, uh, March, April, going to next month. And you can see this dry signal just extending all the way into the early part of the season. And as soon as the monsoon season um, kicks in in the southwest, CPC, Climate Prediction Center, says, no way, I'm not touching that. I'm not even going to try to make a prediction. They'll get right up into Ju June, and then we'll say, I'm not sure, <laughs> because it's that hard to, uh, to predict. On the other flip side, it's warmer. This is trend um, that's showing up in the forecast, and the, the forecast skill is so good in the southwest because of this trend. All you have to do is bet on above average, and you'll be right. And so you see that for every forecast, and you'll see that for every forecast going forward. So thanks. Hopefully we're still on track, and I think I have time for maybe a question. No. Okay. Okay. I know. Me too. <laughs>